Thanks for tuning in. My name is Bob Fisher, K2ND, and I'm going to narrate a presentation I made to the Great South Bay Amateur Radio Club on April 27th, 2023, on the subject of meteorological radio sound tracking. What are we going to cover? Well, we're going to be talking about radios, antennas, and propagation. Uh, there are computers involved in this. We're going to speak about that. The science of meteorology we'll cover briefly. And then the fun part about this is sound chasing and recovery. Why am I here tonight? Well, you have to blame Lou, NO2C. This all started because we had a, an expedition to Bouvet Island this year. And at the same time as the expedition was going on, I was going through some business files from many years ago, and this fell out, and I'd forgotten about this. At the time, in the 70s, I had a lot of business in Norway, and I had several friends who worked for the Norwegian Meteorological Society who were going to be sent down to Bouvet. Um, a couple of them were meteorologists and a couple of them were radio operators. There were five guys who were sent down there and they spent two months at Bouvet. This is a letter they sent me after they got back, uh, came along with a letter and a nice note and all this. But I just love the stamp that came along with the expedition. And that's a picture of one of my friends on Bouvet. He was very proud of that big beard that he'd put together. I, I saw this, I scanned it, and I sent a copy of it over to Lou, NO2C, because I knew he'd get a kick out of it. He had been chasing the boat as they were on their way down to Bouvet. Uh, and um, yes, of course, he, uh, he, this started a conversation about why I was attached to Bouvet in the 78-79 expedition uh, and my connection with meteorology and these guys who were on there for meteorological purposes and there for a long time. Uh, and Lou said, boy, that's a, that's a great story. You should, you should tell people about this. And so that's why I'm here. Let's just get some definitions out of the way. Meteorology is the study of weather and climate. And a radio sound is a device used to measure and transmit meteorological data by telemetry. And the data that's measured by these things is pressure, temperature, humidity, wind speed, and wind direction. There are meteorological stations all over the world and they launch radio sounds twice every day. Worldwide, about 900 sounds are launched and in the United States, about 70. And this picture here, all of the uh, dots on there are what we call upper air stations. Those are stations that uh, launch radio sounds. Amateur radio operators track a lot of the sounds. And on this map, you can see, this is just a, a random sample one day that I took of uh, the sounds that were being tracked at that moment. Each one of the balloons that you see on here are being tracked. And most of the guys who are tracking them are hams. They're also tracked, obviously, by the National Weather Service. They have their own equipment, their own network, and they put together the meteorological data for their own purposes. But the hams who are tracking these signs are also doing exactly the same job, and it could be done remarkably simply. Here on Long Island, where we're located, we have a station at Upton on the grounds of the Brookhaven National Laboratory, an upper air station that launches a balloon every day at about zero Zulu and about 12 Zulu. And it's being tracked by the hams that you see here. WA2TQI is just outside of Philadelphia. K2ND, that's me. I'm on the south shore of Long Island. WJ2B is a bit farther to the east and very close to the launch site. W1VLF is a station I'll have some more information about in the near future. He's not that far from Newington, Connecticut, up in the hills of Connecticut. WA1OJN is well up into Massachusetts, and W1STR over by Boston is the Science and Technology Museum. And all of these guys, as far away as they are, they have no problem picking up the sound because the sound, even though it only transmit 100, 100 milliwatts or so, the sound is high. They'll go up to 100,000 feet. So the range is remarkably good. 
Here's what happens when they launch a balloon. The sonde, the radio sonde, is tied underneath the balloon with a parachute. The balloon rises at about 10 miles an hour. It goes up through the atmosphere. It gets blown around by the wind. It rises up to a roughly 100,000 feet or so, uh, at which time it bursts, only because the balloon gets quite huge and it just can't sustain it anymore. After it, after it bursts, it tumbles around as it falls. The parachute opens and then it settles down fairly slowly and it, and it drops to the ground someplace far away, perhaps even a couple of hundred miles away. This is what it looks like, not exactly at Upton, but uh, this is a typical upper air station launch facility. On the left, you can see a big building, uh, enough to keep the meteorologists and the equipment out of the weather. And uh, when the wind is blowing, that becomes really important. But you blow up the balloon, the, uh, the parachute and the sonde are underneath it, uh, tied by string. And then they uh, run the balloon out into the field and let it go as gently as possible. And usually the sand will clear whatever trees are nearby and float off. Here's an example of what a balloon looks like at altitude. This is a famous picture of the Chinese spy balloon from earlier in 2023 with the equipment uh, strung below it. Uh, and this picture was taken from a U-2 pilot at about 60,000 feet. Now the U-2 is roughly 125 feet long. And you can see that the shadow, the outline of the shadow of the U-2 is less than half the size of that balloon. So the diameter of that balloon was easily 250 feet and it was not at its burst altitude. It was designed to float along at around 60,000 feet. So you can imagine how big that balloon would be as it goes up through the atmosphere. Now the balloons used uh, for radio sound launches are probably quite smaller than what this is. Typically they weigh uh, 300 grams or 600 grams and they're about 10 feet in diameter uh, at most when they're launched, but they easily get above a hundred feet in diameter uh, or up upwards of that uh, when they burst at a hundred thousand feet. And when they burst, it looks just like that picture of the sidewinder going through this Chinese spy balloon. Uh, it's just uh, uh, a, a, a soundless explosion with a bunch of talcum powder that's used inside the balloon to keep it uh, to keep it stable when it's expanding. And the talcum powder just kind of bursts along with the rest of the balloon, and it's impressive to watch. But we all saw that when we saw the sidewinder go through. Back in the 70s and the 80s, when I was in this business, the kind of equipment that was state-of-the-art at the time is pictured on the left. It was a big rack of equipment with a mini computer, floppy disks, the big floppy disks, um, a receiver for telemetry as well as for the um, radio sound, an oscilloscope which was needed for the telemetry. We had a, uh, a rotator for the antenna above that and the chart recorder put out onto that uh, strip right in front of it where an operator had to sit and manually analyze the data coming back from the sonde. When the, when the sonde was done, all of this had to be collated, put into some sort of a, a coded format and sent off to a central location. And that's what the, uh, the machine, the uh, teletype looking machine in the center is all about. On the right hand side, is a picture taken of what I used to track radio sounds. This was equipment sitting around in my basement. And it does the equal job of what is on the left. Uh, in many ways, it does it much better. It does it automatically. And it uploads the data to a local data, to a uh, global data database uh, automatically as well. And all of it was um, just sitting around. The only real cost out of that was uh, the SDR that cost me about $200. This is what a radio sound looks like. On the left is a new one, on the right is an old one. The sound on the left is a Graw DF-17, highly integrated. Uh, the light colored chip on the uh, 
PC board there. That's the GPS receiver. They cost the manufacturer five or 10 bucks. And that's it. That's what they use for navigation uh, and wind finding on there. There's also a thermistor for measuring temperature and a high grister for measuring humidity. And you can see it has a 400 megahertz antenna. It's just a piece of wire that goes down through the styrofoam. And the styrofoam is used to control the temperature of uh, inside the package as it goes up through the atmosphere, because obviously it gets to very, very low temperatures uh, down in the range of minus 100 degrees. On the right is an old sond body from the 1980s. And this was made by a company called VIZ in Philadelphia. The transmitter is on the bottom right. As you can see, it's a single transistor, an LC circuit, so it was tuned each time to make sure it was in the 400 megahertz range. And the output's about 100 milliwatts in both cases, both sons. On the right-hand side of the PC board, you can see two big coils and some electronics. That's the navigation equipment. I'll talk about this later. Uh, this one is an Omega sound because it used the Omega navigation system for wind finding. On the left hand side of the circuit board, you can see the aneroid cell. That's the barometer. It has an arm that uh, swings down across what they call a barrow switch, which had a series of finger contacts. And the operator who was receiving the data would have to decode the um, the sequence of those contacts in order to figure out what the actual barometric pressure was. Overall, remarkably accurate, uh, not as accurate as the, uh, the sound made by Graf uh, on the left. It's a German company, by the way, so it's pronounced Graf, not Gra. Uh, and uh, of course, GPS is much more accurate, uh, but the two sounds are remarkably similar in terms of what they had to perform. It's worth a minute to talk about how wind is discovered. Winds aloft have always been needed knowledge by pilots because it helps them an awful lot. But of course, in the beginning, there was no way to, uh, to know what the winds were in the, in the atmosphere. And in the beginning, you used to launch what was called a pilot balloon or pieball balloon, and you'd track it. And you could just watch it go and you'd, you could figure out uh, what the wind was doing in general as it went up until it disappeared. By using an optical theodolite, and that's what is located in the, uh, that's what's in the picture in the lower left. An optical theodolite is a device that finds the balloon, kind of like looking through a small telescope, and it's all calibrated. So you can tell azimuth and elevation. And we know how quickly the sun goes up through the air it uh, moves at about 10 miles an hour vertically, regardless of what the horizontal speed is. So every minute, that operator at the optical theodolite would read off azimuth and elevation. And that data would be used to make a good calculation, rough calculation of what the wind was until you couldn't see the balloon anymore. After that, they discovered that a radio theodolite would work. It's basically the same concept, only we zero in on the transmitter that's underneath the sun. And the picture on the right is a radio theodolite. Not a great picture of it, but if you can imagine a flat planar antenna with four dipoles in it, each tuned to 400 megahertz. And in the beginning, an operator has to center that antenna on where the radio sound is. And uh, through servos, the, uh, the machinery would make sure that the phase balance between those four antennas became constant. And in doing so, now the antenna followed the radio sound. Simple concept, worked pretty well, uh, depending on how good the mechanics were. Uh, but once again, it simply sends out azimuth and elevation once a minute. And in this case, you'd have a computer doing the uh, calculations for you. After that, we started using radio navigation. And the best of the radio navigation methods were Omega and Loran. I'm sure everybody is familiar with Loran C. It was at 100 kilohertz. A very good system. 
not worldwide, but there were many Lorands around the world and they were used effectively for wind finding just by receiving the Lorand signals from the radio sound and sending them back down to the ground station. And as the Lorand location changed, we would simply calculate the lat long and that would give you a very good close estimation of how the winds were. The Omega system, less known by most people, it was a radio navigation system that was between 10 and 13.6 kilohertz. There were eight transmitters located around the world. They had a lot of power. And at that frequency, you can imagine what the wavelength is like. So in effect, the ionosphere and ground form a kind of a, a waveguide at those frequencies. So the wave travels very, very effectively for great distances. The eight transmitters were in Hawaii, North Dakota, Argentina, Norway, uh, Liberia, Liberia Reunion, Japan, and Australia. And those eight transmitters covered the world. Any place on Earth, you would be able to pick up at least three transmitters. And from three transmitters, you could do the, the math to calculate what lat longs you would be at. Obviously, it's not as exact as Loran, uh, but uh, it was pretty good. And you could go any place in the world and you could do wind finding uh, in the strangest spots in the world because you knew that you could always get Omega. And these days, obviously, as the Graf Sond does, it uses GPS, which is very accurate and very reliable. This shows the equipment in use at K2ND. And I want to emphasize Alternate approaches exist. There are other ways to do this. This happens to be what I used because it was sitting around in my basement when I got interested in tracking radio sounds. Uh, there were other ways to do it with other pieces of, uh, with other devices. Uh, some of them are better, uh, but uh, this works very nicely at K2ND. You need an antenna for 400 megahertz. You need some feed line. You need a receiver, and SDR is probably the best solution. You need a computer with a sound card and a display. You need an audio translator software. I use virtual audio cable, which costs about $25. And it takes the, the data that comes out of your SDR and feeds it into the translation software that's going to analyze that data. And that software, in my case, I use Sond Monitor from a uh, company in Portugal called COAA. It costs about $25. Very effective for decoding the, soft, the uh, transmissions that are coming out of the Sond. An internet connection is a good idea because if you want to, you can take the data that is being decoded from the radio Sond and feed it into a central database that's kept um, uh, for the use of amateurs and professionals alike. You could say, you could look at it in terms of you are uh, adding to the scientific uh, database available to the public by doing this. And it's a nice public service. What antenna is going to work best? This is something we should all be familiar with. A quarter wave vertical over normal ground its peak radiation pattern is up around 20 or 25 degrees. A 5 8 wave has a little bit of gain and its radiation pattern peaks at around 10 or 15 degrees. And more importantly, if you follow that blue line, it has a much better response close to the surface. And that's the important point for tracking radio signs because of this. The next slide shows what the sound elevation angle looks like under a couple of conditions. Here in Brightwaters, if a sound is launched from Upton and there's no wind, uh, after 60 minutes of going up at 10 miles an hour, the sound is going to be about 60 degrees up in the air, ver essentially going vertically. But if the average wind is at 33 miles an hour, that's the lower of those uh, you can see that at 60 minutes, the sand is up around 10 degrees at 33 miles an hour average wind. After two hours of flight, it might get to 15 degrees. 
if the wind aloft is 66 miles an hour on average, it never gets to 10 degrees. And last winter, we went through weeks when I never saw a sun go above 10 degrees, many times never got above five degrees because the wind aloft gets very high. In the winter time, the jet stream can easily be 100 miles an hour or more. So add that to uh, the strong winds that are at the surface at that time. And that sign is gonna be low on the horizon as you track it. So the antenna, the better the uh, low angle radiation pattern from the antenna, the better you're going to be receiving the signals. This might be obvious to most people who already know UHF and VHF, but I'm an HF guy and this was driven home to me that the coax is very important. If you're using RG58, the loss is about 10 dB per 100 feet at 440 megahertz. RG8 loses 8 dB uh, at 400 megahertz. That's 100 feet. And I was using LMR400, which is supposed to lose about 3 dB per 100 feet. And I had 100 feet of cable out there. And I use a um, I use a, an analyzer that only goes to 180 megahertz made by MFJ. And it told me that at 180 megahertz, my cable was to spec. I borrowed a vector analyzer from Lou, NO2C, in order to uh, design the antenna. And the first thing I did was to check out the cable at 400 megahertz. And instead of losing 3 dB, I was losing at least 15 dB. It was older cable. Obviously, it had aged, and it aged very poorly in a way that, uh, in the way that the higher the frequency, the worse it was going to be. So I had to replace the cable. The SDR that I use is the RSPDX. Uh, it cost me about $200, or it costs about $200. Uh, and you can buy it uh, on the internet very easily. Uh, it's made by a company over in England. It's an excellent device. It was reviewed a couple of years ago by QST. Uh, you can find that review and read about it. But uh, I, like, I like this one very much because it has great uh, specifications to it. Here's another one you can look at, though. And this one is cheap. If you notice, this one at the time was $26.99. It's called an ESP32, um, also called uh, LoRa, L-O-R-A for long range. Uh, this is a receiver uh, that is dedicated in frequency. The one I took the screen, the screen cut on here, it's for 915 megahertz. Uh, but obviously they make one for the 432 megahertz range, and that's the one you would buy for doing radio sounds. They're incredibly cheap. They're good receivers. You can build a complete radio sound receiver using this device, a battery, and a cell phone. And that's all you need. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful piece of work. It's also a transmitter, a remarkable piece of equipment for under thirty dollars. Here's an article that was in QST recently, uh, and it started an awful lot of people tracking radio sounds. Um, Steve Ford put the article together. It's actually written by um, a French ham, who has software called My Sandy Go which you put into that ESP receiver that we had on the slide before this, uh, it loads up in there and it automatically will track radio sounds for you. Uh, and this turned an awful lot of people onto the, the technology of uh, being able to track these sounds. This is a picture of what my receiver looks like, what my computer looks like in my basement workshop. On the top is the actual receiver, and below that is the data being recorded from the sound. Uh, on the top, if you look in the upper right-hand side of that, that's the modulation display. It's narrowband FM, takes up about 10 kilohertz or so. You can see that there are two sidebands on either side of the center frequency. And in the center, you can see the frequency, 405.410 megahertz. There's a small S meter, an old fashioned looking S meter on the display. Uh, and just below that is the spectrum display of about a megahertz with the signal I'm tracking in the center uh, and a display that shows uh, in a bar graph 
the S meter, as well as the SNR, which is around 18.3 dB at the time. That receiver display is what you get with the uh, RSPDX receiver when you buy it. Below that is another display. I'll get to the next signed, uh, slide. Okay, here's the, the signed monitor data display. This is the display of the data coming back from the radio sound. And not to go into any fine detail on this, but the uh, on the left hand side you have temperature and dew point, which measures humidity. And on the right hand side you can see the, the wind flags. They show where the wind is coming from and the speed of the wind is denoted by the number of little bars on, uh, on each one of the, the wind flags. Earlier I mentioned W1VLF, who does an awful lot of radio sound tracking. He's up uh, in the hills of Connecticut. And this is worth showing you just what he uses. He has this cool drone footage of his antenna. This is sitting on top of a 120 foot tower. Uh, and as you can see, he has this commanding view. Uh, he's looking out over north uh, up towards Canada and south over the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm going to stop this here and go to the next slide because this shows what he can receive. The uh, software that he's using allows him to show the history of what he's received over time. And on the left hand side, you can see that he easily tracks down to the Wallops Island launch site, Wallops Island, Virginia, on the eastern shore. And he can track sons all the way up into Canada and out through the, uh, the top of Maine. The setup that he has is on the right hand side, he's using four SDRs networked together, uh, and his software allows him to track four sons at a time. WJ2B is located here on Long Island, and this is a screenshot from one day when he was tracking three signs at a time. You notice that it shows lots of information about the signs in addition to the meteorological information. The website that I use for finding and tracking all the other guys who are tracking signs is called sondhub.org. And this is a screenshot of what it looks like. The left-hand side of the screen shows all the signs in the world that the sound hub knows about. The balloons uh, that you see on the actual display or balloons being tracked by somebody, you can see the track of that balloon in color. Uh, and if you zoom in on it, in fact, it will predict where the balloon is going to be when it bursts and where it will land. And because of that, a lot of people like to uh, track along with it. And if they can't pick up a sound, they'll go out and track it down. Here's what happened recently, April 15th. WJ2B, Joe, he was tracking the sound. It happened to be a very light wind day all the way up and down. So you can see the track of that sound. It uh, meandered up to the north, meandered a little bit to the east, meandered down to the south and the east for a while. And when it burst, it caught the same winds coming down that it did going up. So it meandered up to the north and it happened to land just outside of Amagansett. So Joe hopped in his car and he drove out east. And this is what he found. If you look closely, you can see the yellow, the orange parachute sitting up in the tree and Below that, if you look directly below that, you can see a very small white box, and that's the that's the uh, Graf Sand sitting underneath it. So Joe walked up to the homeowner, asked permission to go back uh, into the woods, and he recovered the sand. And there are a lot of guys out west who recover these sands every day. It's kind of a, an obsession to some of them, some of them uh, because it takes them out into beautiful territory and uh, oftentimes leads them through uh, interesting areas and some interesting people along the way before they get a trophy and drive home with it. And these sounds are reusable, by the way. Finally, there is a face group, a Facebook group 
for the enthusiasts. Uh, it's called Radio Sound North America, Weather Balloon Tracking and Recovery. It's run by a guy named Rands Parker, who lives out around Salt Lake City, which happens to be a very good area for chasing, chasing uh, radio signs and balloons. And I recommend this to anybody who gets interested in doing this because they're a great group of guys in this group. Uh, they're very helpful. Uh, they love to post their own experiences. And from my experience, they jump right in if somebody is asking questions about how to do this or to do it better. So I thank you very much. I hope uh, you found it interesting and uh, I appreciate uh, you tuning in today.